For more discussion on the achievements of Shanghai's Pudong districts, let's bring our correspondent Li Jianhua in Shanghai. Hello, Jianhua. Yes, Dreamfeng, and can you imagine it? This is already 30 years for Pudong, and now let me bring you to the boundary area, and we have set our crew over here so that you can see the uh, bound to the financial center just behind us, the beautiful view over here. You know, 30 years ago, it was a different view, absolutely. But now, high-rise buildings and skyscrapers dominate the Huangpu River. And now, especially at this time, at the sunset, and the, all the buildings are gilded, so beautiful here. And of course, today, about the development of Pudong over the past 30 years, I'm not alone. Now, let me bring you uh, my guest over here. Today, that is Professor Rodrigo Zidane from New York University in Shanghai. Welcome to the program. And also we have Ms. Jenny John, General Manager of Bellagio by MGM Shanghai. Welcome to Thank both you. of you to our program today. So President Xi Jinping gave a speech this morning just across this river. And he said that Shanghai should be the pioneer of reform and opening up at a higher level. And also he stressed the importance of building China into a modern so socialist country or socialism with Chinese characteristics. So Professor, let me go to you first. And how do you assess the, uh, the speech? And then can you help us dissect it? And then how do you understand it? This is a very important uh, speech because it highlights the importance of globalization, um, especially given that not only the pandemic, but other um, political movements by countries around the world have started a process of deglobalization and decoupling between um, China and the rest of the world. Then stressing opening up and stressing trade and investment and the role of Shanghai and China in general on the future of trade and the, the, the global economy is of paramount importance, especially given that China, like at the end of the global financial crisis in 2009 and 8, most likely will be the great engine of growth for the global economy that is going to pull the other countries from the pandemic recession as soon as the crisis abates. Yeah, I think that is under the discussion of globalization. And then, Ms. Zhang, what's your take on that? Yeah, definitely I can, uh, I can speak from the perspective from hospitality industry. And uh, especially uh, during, after this pandemic uh, in Shanghai, uh, it came up to my realization, it, out of the surprise, and we recovered really well. And uh, we were able to uh, break even um, from business perspective and the hotel starting to make profit. And financial performance even exceeded uh, our budget goals. So from our perspective, we have very optimistic view uh, for the economy situation um, in China, in Shanghai, and also especially uh, the influence from the financial um, center of uh, Pudong in Shanghai. Yeah, from uh, the financial center in mm, Shanghai here mm. when it comes to the hospitality industry. And uh, Professor Zidane, you are from your university in Shanghai. So from your perspective in the education sector, how do you think that sort of Pudong's development over the past 30 years could be contributing to the development of the uh, education sector in Shanghai and beyond? The, the way that I think about uh, China and about the dynamics of Chinese uh, growth in the long run is the fact that China is moving away from a um, um, low-skilled, in, intensive economy to a much more complex and much more high-skill economy. In that sense, uh, education and bringing universities and bringing uh, top-level research into, the, into, into China so that um, this can spill over uh, to, the, to the country is, of, again, is very important for the development of China because China will not continue being just the manufacturer of, um, of goods with economies of scale. China will certainly move towards uh, more complex and more sophisticated products is already happening and it should only accelerate with time. Yeah, that's right. And you once said you went on record as saying that China is already a service economy. Okay, thank you very much. And then also, Ms. John, I would like to pick your brains a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to China's opening up, especially in Shanghai, do you have any suggestions? And in what way do you think that the hospitality industry could be supported by the local government's policies? 
Um, you know, I must say that um, our hospitality industry has been beneficial from the support of uh, local government. Um, and, uh, you know, um, especially with uh, Pudong, and uh, it is the financial center in China, attracts a lot of financial, uh, global-wise uh, financial companies and uh, luxury hotel brands. And uh, we have been benefiting getting a lot of business from Pudong area, and uh, especially in financial uh, financial leisure segments and uh, I think uh, this trend will continue and the uh, hotel industry will continue to benefit uh, from the, the rapid development of uh, Pudong area. Okay, thank you very mm. much for your insight, Professor mm. Zidan and also Ms. Zhang. And Jun Feng, we will continue our discussion on CGTN social media. And of course, because of time for TV is quite limited. Of course, for our viewers, if you're interested in the discussion, and then you can follow us on CGTN social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Weibo, where you can find us. You can also leave our comments there, and we'll get back to your question as soon as possible. Now back to Jun Feng. Thank you, Jun Feng. I hope you and your guests are enjoying the great view. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, for our viewers who have just joined us, and we are broadcasting live in the eastern Chinese city of Shanghai, and just now we did a TV live. Okay, it was a little bit short and concise for five minutes, but we're going to continue our discussion here on CGT and social media platforms, CGT and app, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube once again. Of course, if you have any questions for me or for Professor Rodrigo Zidane or Ms. Janet John over here for hospitality industry or business and finance as general as a whole and then you can leave your comments down there on Facebook and then I'm gonna get your comments and then get back to them as soon as possible. Let's continue our discussion over here. Okay, so when it comes to Pudong over here and we have the beautiful view especially every time, every day around this time, it is, uh, I love this time, it is sunset, yeah. it's gilded, yeah. right? It's and then what is your first impression? And both of you, you have been living here for nearly 10 years, and for Professor Rodrigo, 10 years, and for you, that's seven years. You have been living in the United States, in California. Mm. Okay, so what was your impression? Let me go to you first. When you first landed in Shanghai oh. years ago, it, it was quite dramatic. Um, quite dramatic. Uh, yeah, my first time came to Shanghai was the year 2010, and I came to Shanghai in the night time. So uh, I remembered I lived in a um, Ritz Carlton Hotel on the 46th floor. I opened the curtain. I was shocked about the development in Shanghai because I left China when I was quite young. Uh -huh. And uh, thinking about Shanghai, especially Pudong area, uh, I, w I could only remember the Oriental, Oriental Pearl building mm -hmm. and around the building there were a lot of old houses and uh, cropland <laughs> in that area. So it was amazing. Um, um, immediately I was attracted to the city and uh, I worked for Ritz Carlton for about six years and uh, <laughs> consecutively. And, uh, uh, beautiful city. Um, beautiful city, beautiful the charm city. of this city. Right? Yeah, then I left China, I left mm -hmm. China, I came back again last year, and it's different again, you know, um, mm. uh, more vibrant, and the economy is uh, even getting better, and uh, the city is more modernized. Yeah, so, that's right, and that is yeah. why we call this city modern city yes. in the Mandarin Chinese, right? Exactly. It is definitely uh, getting quite different, like mm. seven years. If you are talking about years apart for a Chinese city, especially for a city like Shanghai, it's going to be very different. How about you, Professor Rodrigo? And you have been teaching here for quite a few years in uh, New York University in Shanghai. And of course, before that, you were here. And then what was your first impression when you first landed? It was quite interesting. The, the way that I put it uh, today is that um, Shanghai is the city of the 22nd century. So we are really so looking. Century. Yes, okay. we are really looking at the future of um, many great urban areas in the world. Um, because and and the difference is that yes, if you are in the side of the river, mm -hmm. you're gonna see still you have some character uh, very close by. You're gonna have markets and you're gonna have uh, housings that have been pretty much the same for 50 or 60 years. But Shanghai is so dynamic, mm -hmm. and again, it's planned, 
And the new area, especially um, uh, Lu Jiasui and, and the areas of Pudong over there, because they can be planned and they, can, they are open, they are green, and really is about the, the future of um, uh, cities when they work right. That they are just not something that grows organically, which is, which is fair enough, which is good, but they need some steering towards um, really opening up the city to its citizens in a way that makes living uh, in Shanghai more pleasurable over time, which has happened over the 10 years I've been either coming to China or living in China. Okay, so when it comes to Shanghai, I mean, this is quite iconic. This is the landmark of Shanghai and beyond in China. You probably, I think many of viewers have seen this view. The tall buildings of there, four of them quite famous in Shanghai, probably in movies or probably some TV promos of there. And, but Pudong is not just like this. I think this is the stereotype. I don't know if you agree with me. I think that's the stereotype. Pulled on like tall buildings, skyscrapers. But actually, there is more behind those fancy buildings. I mean, there is a vast land over there, waiting to be developed, right? So, Jenny, because you work in the hospitality industry, mm. when it comes to land, when it comes to land ownership, and then when it comes to the development of land over there, I think you have a lot to say about that. How do you think? The uh, hospitality industry has been developing over the past uh, three decades. Mm. And what do you see in the future? Oh, I see a um, tremendous opportunity uh, for the growth of hospitality industry, especially hotel industry in China. So um, let's say uh, use the hotel room as a quota. Uh, I know in five years, China will be like the U.S. Um, two largest um, countries have the most hotel rooms. Um, in the U.S., it's about 20 hotel rooms per capita. Oh. Yeah. But in China, it's only five hotel rooms in capita, which means we need to open, in China, we need to open five hotel, five, five, five-star hotels per day. Per day? In, per day, in order to catch, you know, up, up to that level. But we, uh, what my research had had told me that it's going to be the trend and, and the, the market is still uh, very um, desirable of developing more hotels in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is more needs actually. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of uh, great plans from luxury hotel brands and uh, developing more hotels. Uh, for example, MGM Bellagio is the top brand of um, MGM in the U.S. And uh, we are new in China. Uh, so far, we only have four hotels in China. But we are planning to develop 25 hotels before year 2025, which means four hotels per year. Four hotels per year, that's, that's, correct. that's a miracle. It's a very aggressive, uh, it's already on, on our mission that, uh, is, uh, that those properties had been in process, in process of developing, the contract had been signed. So that's the speed of development of hotel um, business in, in China or in Shanghai. And uh, very optimistic. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, and you're is, quite optimistic is. about that. Very much so. Five hotels in a year. Yes. That's yes. a lot. And then, Professor Rodrigo, you once said that China is a service economy. I know that's the part that the Chinese government is trying to embark on, okay, to make the country a service economy, especially in Shanghai. Shanghai is the financial center of this country. And then, can you further elaborate on that, especially together with the hospitality industry that sure. Jenny talked about? Um, I have, when people talk about China in the future, I usually say that, that people overestimate China in the short run and underestimate yeah. China in the long run. That the, the capacity for China to grow is there. If it is going to happen, we are going to see. Um, there are many pitfalls that, that um, Chinese policymakers have to avoid um, for China to continue to develop. In terms of the economic activity of China, GDP has half of GDP is, is more than half of GDP is now from services. And that was a level that was reached only in 2014-15, which is 
completely different from the, the structure of, of the economies around the world. For instance, in the case of the US, we think of the US as this huge economic powerhouse, but almost 80%, like three quarters of, of the American economy is services. Yeah. Education, tourism, hospitality. And that is the path that China is gonna take as well because that's the path that, that countries take as they develop. Um, today we, we know of China as this industrial powerhouse manufacturing, but that is not gonna be that in the future. Now, of course, the, the Chinese model is different. The Chinese model, the, the model of Chinese characteristics is that supply is increasing. As Jenny said, there will be, their, their group are gonna build five hotels per year. The question is, will there be demand in the future? Will those hotels be able to be filled? Will people's incomes continue to rise? So there is that, and that is the dynamics that yeah. China has been able to get right for the last 30 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. But that is where people are always afraid that there will be a hard landing. Yeah. What happens when there is a possible uh, crisis and the hotels are empty? Mm -hmm. can, can companies survive this type of cash flow crunch? I think that's a very good question, especially right. during this time, the mm -hmm. pandemic is still rampant in mm -hmm. the United States mm -hmm. and Europe. Mm -hmm. And then so it is a impact on the hospitality mm -hmm. industry as a whole. I mean, in China, actually, it is starting to recover mm -hmm. starting February, maybe. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, started in April. In yeah, April. Uh, but uh, overall, the hotel business has dropped seventy six percent compared to year two thousand nineteen. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. in the entire China market for mm -hmm. hotel industry. But uh, in in Shanghai, this market is very um, is is very unique. Mm -hmm. um, for example, for Bellagio by MGM Shanghai, we recovered rapidly. Uh, we were able to break even, as I said, in May and starting to make profit in June and July. And our um, GOP is starting to exceed the original, prior to pandemic, original budget uh, started in the month of July. Mm -hmm. So um, even until today, you know, uh, our financial performance is still quite positive. Uh, I must say that, you know, um, it's quite surprising. You know, it came out of surprise by a lot of hoteliers in Shanghai. That um, is quite surprising, yes, actually. It is. The other Especially day, especially for yeah. luxury hotels. For luxury hotels, right. the other day I talked to um, the CEO of Porsche China, that is also the luxury products yeah. produ producer. And so when it comes to luxury cars, just like luxury hotels, mm. and actually it recovered really fast and then it is increasing at a faster pace somehow right. after the pandemic was brought under control in yes. China or in Shanghai specifically. Mm. So it is quite surprising. And then Professor Rodrigo, do you find it a little bit different? The, the recovery of China? Certainly. Um, Especially when it comes to luxury products like luxury hotels, yeah. the cars that I talked to the CEO the other day. It's a little bit different from any other country in the world. And, and the reason for that, in, in the case of, the, of luxury consumer goods, is the fact that a lot of, because in China, uh, tariffs are high. Mm -hmm. Usually, if people want to buy luxury goods, they travel, they do it, they do it abroad. Uh, when when the pandemic yeah. locks people out of, of international markets, mm -hmm. then if people want, like I've been locked down for two months, so I want to buy something nice for myself, I do not have the option of traveling and buying that abroad. So the, 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 the luxury goods markets in China has exploded uh, for the last five to six months. Now, of course, there will be uh, uh, some kind of landing as economies open up and the difference in prices uh, uh, come back to what they were, which I believe is going to happen. But that is luxury markets. Um, it's also interesting, but it's interesting to see that 
we will never have such a deep crisis as this one. And the economy has been able to survive. Mm -hmm. Even though many companies are not going to survive, there has not been the case of a structural crisis that may plunge China into uh, such a crisis that is going to derail Chinese development. And a lot of people were afraid of that. And I was a little bit afraid of that. And having returned to Shanghai and getting the data uh, from companies like that and seeing how companies are, are flexible in being able to adapt to this new economic situation, I, I revised my, my, my diagnosis and my, my perspective of, of Chinese growth. And I think China next year is not only going to grow, but it's going to be the main engine of the world recovery. I remember you said that it was 5.5. You uh, you're, you're talking about the growth. Yeah. That, so I'm going to give you uh, data from the country where I'm from, Brazil. Um, in 2008, 2009 was the global financial crisis. Yeah. And most of the world, most of the of middle income and rich countries in 2009, their economy shrunk. In 2010, the Brazilian economy grew by 7%. And a lot of it was led by the recovery of China and exports and trade and investment. And I think this is going to happen again. Yeah. And when it comes to Chinese economy, is it growing really fast? And especially in the second quarter and the third quarter. And when it comes to Shanghai, let's come back to this topic of Pudong's sure. development. And then Shanghai is the engine when it comes to the economic growth in China, right? And especially it is contributing a lot to the uh, hospitality industry here. So how do you see that in the next five years? And you said, you just said that it's going to be five hotels, five yeah. luxury hotels in a year. So five years, is it going to be 25? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, how do you see the potential of Shanghai? Um, for Shanghai, I think it's uh, uh, the volume of business will remain yeah. uh, in a po very positive way. Mm -hmm. However, if the segmentation, the business mix may shift. For example, for hotel, luxury hotels in Shanghai, we have been receiving very high-end, um, you know, working with high-end tra luxury travel agents agencies. We have top, uh, very high-end clientele, and normally they will travel abroad because of the situation. They all come into Shanghai, and uh, our ADR, average daily rate, has broke the record broken the record of the, in the past. And uh, the average daily rate has raised about uh, 300 RMB above previous year. And 300 RMB. 300 RMB. Mm. Yeah. So it's a significant improvement for hotel business. Can you, can you help us understand it? Because most of viewers don't understand uh, the, uh, I mean, the dynamics behind it and the 300 RMB. It's and a, what for does example, it mean? For example, our current average daily rate for a mm. hotel room uh, mm -hmm. is, a, is around 2,500. 2, yeah, that's the, that's the current average daily rate of a mm. hotel room. And prior to pandemic, we were sitting at around 1,900. So you can see the growth of the ADR and uh, uh, the overall hotel revenue, not only rooms and food and beverage seg segments. And uh, we have, you know, the revenue increase is quite significant. And sure. Yeah, it's a very positive. And I will see this trend um, in in next yeah, three to five years. Yes, yeah. can I ask you a question? Mm. Um, were the mix between corporate events mm. and individuals. Is right. it that is still the same or has that shift towards more individual travelers or yeah. or like congresses, conferences? Yeah. Very good question. And now it's all about leisure business. Mm -hmm. Individual travelers, a family business. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we used to get mice like a group business or corporate business had significantly decreased because of the closing of the border. Yeah. Uh, but however, domestic traveling has 
grown so rapidly uh, in recent six, five to six months. And because yeah. they couldn't travel abroad, they couldn't, like yeah. what the professor said just now. They all came to Shanghai, like major cities in Shanghai. I think Shanghai, uh, Beijing and Guangzhou are all doing very well. And neighboring cities like Hangzhou, Suzhou, they are doing very well as well. Yeah, and I have this question for Professor Rodrigo because of that and also for mm. Jenny. So individual travelers now are traveling to Shanghai and mm. you said Beijing, all the top cities is in China. Mm. And why are they moving or why are they traveling to the top cities instead of some other cities actually? What is the, uh, what is the reason behind it? What is attracting them? Um, definitely, you know, luxury goods. They yeah. can buy Louis Vuitton, Cartier, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> these are luxury products in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, because of traveling abroad and uh, going, maybe Sanya is a, another location for them yeah. to go to the scenery locations. The free trip port. Right. But however, in Shanghai, they are able to enjoy beautiful hotel rooms and uh, culinary arts. And uh, um, I think a lot of travelers, they intending to stay in hotel rooms, in hotels, to enjoy their vacations or staycations yeah. uh, or holidays. Um, uh, I think this is the reason for luxury hotels have been so well lately. Okay, yeah. so for basically that, that is about the luxury goods, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, uh, in my way, it's a little bit more than that. Uh -huh. Shanghai is maybe the closest that, we, we, that China has to a global city. Yeah. Right? A city that is that is international in nature. Mm -hmm. For many travelers, they want to experience that. They want to see uh, uh, foreigners. They want to they want to look at museums, or mm -hmm. they want to they want to experience the culture of a global city. And yes, there are there, there are beautiful cities in China. People can go to Guilin to enjoy the scenery, the nature. Mm -hmm. But if you want the the globalness, the, mm. the, the, the life of a global, there is, if you cannot travel anywhere, Shanghai, Shanghai. Yeah. Okay. I, that is, that is my view. If, mm. if I, if I were in China, I wanted to experience, like, I want to get the best French food, mm. but I cannot go to Paris, yeah. Yeah, come can. to Shanghai. Yeah. yeah, when it comes to globalization, as you said just now, definitely it's going to be Shanghai. And this is probably the, uh, what do we call it, the mini cosmos of globalization over here, or globalism. Mm -hmm. And then behind us, of course, for our viewers who have just joined us, this is CGTN, we're broadcasting live in Shanghai. And we're talking about the development of Pudong. You probably could recognize the view behind us, beautiful view over here. This is sunset. So I think all of the buildings will light up pretty soon, and then you're going to enjoy the beautiful view mm -hmm. along the Huangpu River down there. That's beautiful. Okay, so uh, let's continue our discussion over here. And then we have been talking about the potential of Shanghai and why it is growing so fast when, it's to, when it comes to hospitality industry, is, even though the pandemic is still here, right, in China and beyond. Of course, China, it has been brought under control already. And then, so when it comes to businesses, I think it's a question for Professor Rodrigo. There are so many enterprises, multinational companies here, especially over there. There are tons of multinational corporations over there. I would like to know what are the reasons behind that? Why do they flock to Shanghai? And when the Pudong New Area was established 30 years ago, what were the policies actually made by the Chinese government back then to attract so many enterprises? So in a way, you, you can always offer tax incentives, right? That is part of the reason why the finance industry has come to Pudong. Uh, but when we have this clusterization of companies, they come usually from, from actually from labor market uh, pooling. Let me give an example. If I am, if I am a multinational company and I want to have a foothold in China, mm -hmm. I will need global citizens. I will need Chinese citizens that, that, that speak good English or that speak French or they speak Dutch. Uh, I will need Dutch people who can uh, be part of this world, and they cannot, they cannot find that in many cities in China, the same way that they wouldn't be able to find that in many cities in any other middle-income country. And in a way, that is the, the main advantage that Shanghai has. I think Shanghai has over 600,000 foreigners in the city. Right, so is is the size of 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 
many European capitals in terms of international people. So it provides a, a, a very good opportunity if a company wants to be established in China. Having an office in Shanghai, it's easier in terms of the infrastructure, and that is also something that the Chinese government had, has done very well in Pudong, is like, okay, companies want to come here, they need fast internet access, they need good infrastructure, so let's build that. And they were successful in doing that, and uh, for that reason, Pudong is the success that it is. Okay, and then when it comes to the hospitality industry, specifically here, why did you bring MGM to Shanghai in the first place? And then I know, like business people or business professionals are usually quite sensitive when it comes to business operations. Right. So you brought it from the United States to Shanghai, yeah. and then what was the reason behind it? And then what mm. we're looking for? Of course, uh, potential growth uh, for MGM, and you know MGM is coming from Las Vegas mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And Bellagio, it is the second Bellagio hotel mm -hmm. in the world. Okay. Um, definitely, um, um, gambling is not legalized mm -hmm. in China, and uh, we emphasize on hotel man management segment mm -hmm. of the business. Um, MGM. It's supposed to be an entertainment and a casino management like uh, were owned, like, yeah, like Macau. But in China specifically, we're only managing hotels. Mm -hmm. Our, ho for example, Bellagio by MGM Shanghai, the owning company is Suning. Mm -hmm. uh, Suning uh, is our owner, and it's being managed by Diao Yutai. Um, and MGM. Uh, oh. It's a joint venture company um, uh, of China and US. It's a joint venture, yes. okay. Yeah, before yes. we go, I have a question for each of you here. Um, Jenny, is you are from the United States and yeah. then you live in San Francisco, right? Bay the Bay Area. Yeah. And then, so can you help us understand or can you make a comparison over here? Is there anything like that, like the Pudong New Area here mm. in San Francisco? I, Definitely, I can relate to San Francisco. Uh -huh. um, um, uh, San Francisco is also the financial center in California of the, uh, and also in the world. And uh, I can see that side of uh, San Francisco a lot. It's a very uh, diversified, diversified uh, area, um, have many cultures. And uh, um, yeah, that's uh, what I see Pudong. Um, okay. So it's very much like the uh Chinese version of Pudong over there in San Francisco. That's right. Okay, and how about Professor Rodrigo? In Brazil, do you have anything like the new area and the government will have some preferential policies for the development of this specific area to boost up the, uh, to boost the economy? We do have free trade zones, but they haven't worked uh -huh. uh, for many years. Uh, we have, for instance, one in the Amazon area, mm -hmm. and the idea was let's populate some of the Amazon uh, uh, region, and that's there are huge subsidies, uh, implicit subsidies on that. Uh, but the reason that it hasn't worked in Brazil to the same extent is that um, the Chinese government has, the, especially the Shanghai, the Pudong government, has been able to improve their institutional framework over time. Mm -hmm. Is the fact that, for instance, China is a middle-income country, corruption happens. And Brazil is a middle-income country where co corruption happens. Um, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna, corruption is not gonna disappear overnight. So it's a process of, of reducing it over time. And that's one of the reasons that Pudong has worked, is that when companies come here, maybe they have trouble uh, with red tape. Maybe they have uh, trouble with setting up their business or accounting or being investigated for bringing money to the country, but all of this has been getting better. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, that's what makes a dynamic part of the city. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, in California, there were 10 or 12 different uh, propositions brought forward um, in, the, in the latest election, things about do you want to increase property taxes? And most people voted no to every kind of proposition that derail business, businesses. Uh -huh. And that helps businesses plan for the future. Yeah, that's right. And unfortunately in Brazil, we have been stuck 
in terms of, of policies to reduce red tape, to reduce bureaucracy, to make it easier for companies to trade and to make. And in that sense, we do not have the same kind of dynamic area like Pudong like in, in Shanghai. Pudon or in California. But exactly. Pudong is developing um, little by little. Exactly. Always say they are fine tuning the policies inch by inch here, right? Okay, thank you very much for joining us. It was a lovely discussion about the Pudong's development. Okay, for our viewers who have just joined us, so I think this is the end of our conversation already. You can watch the replay definitely. If you love the uh, discussion and you can repost it or don't forget to give a heart. And of course, you can also follow Professor Rodrigo Zidane on Twitter. And of course, you can also follow Jenny John on your social media platform, right? And I really love this uh, balcony over here. And this place is China Communications Construction Shanghai Dredging Company Limited. So that we can have a beautiful view over here that's lovely okay thank you very much for watching us thank you so much have a nice day bye bye thank you thank, thank you, you.